the preliminary data says that the answer appears to be yes. So we're, this is this is hot off the press. We're not going to publish anything until we can verify with, whether the initial results are in fact true. But if it is true, that's a gigantic leverage into understanding how to make this thing work. Because I suspect that if, if at some time we actually produce a technology at this point, it will be very similar to uh, the kind of people who can operate a jet aircraft. So if you chose Joe Sixpack off the street and you thrust them into a cockpit, you're not going to be very good. You need somebody with talent and a lot of training to be able to use this kind of technology, at least at the initial stages. And moderators, things like set and setting, lunar cycle, solar cycle, geocosmic factors, all of which are known to play a role in whether or not these phenomena work. So those have to be figured in as well. So here's our current focus at this point is looking at new kinds of targets. So I'll simply mention that if you look in the literature here for mind-matter interaction targets, the vast majority of them involve the tossing of dice, roughly from the 1930s to the 1960s, and then the use of electronic random number generators, which is kind of the equivalent of dice, except based on quantum events, from the 1960s to today. So that's where most of the literature is. However, there are also a lot of other studies doing things like plastic, bouncing plastic balls and the turbulence in water, linear and torsion pendulums, strain gauges, magnetometers, structure of water, and so on. And on the living side, we have things all the way from cells to human health and behavior have been used as targets of intentional influence. If you took the preponderance of the evidence across the board here for both inanimate and animate objects, you find evidence. There is evidence that intention does do something in all of these different systems. The degree to which it does it is much, much smaller on inanimate systems than it is on animate systems. So it seems like the living systems are more responsive to these kinds of intentional effects. So the sensors we're testing at the moment most have to do with photons, things like wave interference, polarization, absorption, or scattering of photons, and entanglement. And also, just recently, electrical plasma. And also, quantum noise. So let's just say a few words about this. Uh, Lauren will fill you in on and some, and Arno and uh, Garrett will also mention it. So the photon wave of interference effect is based on the quantum observer effect. Whereas if you look at a particle, it collapses, so-called. If you are observing a quantum object, it becomes localized in space-time. And if you're not looking at it, it seems to be spread out over space-time. So if you have a laser and it's coming through two little slits, and the two portions of the laser that's coming through the slits are exactly in phase, you'll end up with a bright spot. This is the classic double slit interference pattern. But if those two phases are just slightly out of phase, you'll end up with a dark spot. And that's how you end up with bright and dark bands in this experiment. So the idea in this experiment is, can we just barely change the phase of one of the beams of light? And if we could, we can turn a dark spot into light or the other way around. So that's where we're looking in this experiment. So here I am looking down the barrel of our latest version of a double set experiment. That's what it looks like from the side. And here's the camera that's looking at a portion of the interference pattern. And this is devised in such a way that if you are mentally observing the system from a distance, if you are successful, then you would increase the amount of light that the camera is seeing. And if you withdraw your attention, you would decrease the amount of light. So the underlying important question here is not only is there an effect, but is it causal? And is my observation of the system causing it to change its behavior? So, we can say it in different ways. The illumination level that the camera sees modulated according to the assigned instructions. Instruction meaning to concentrate, that's what the C means, or to relax. To concentrate is directing your attention toward the system, relax as you pull it away. 30 second uh, periods, and if it's causal, the results are gonna look something like this. You get more light when you're concentrating, less when you're not, more when you are, and so on. So we can ask this question, uh, for all of the data that we've collected so far. And the black line here is experimental data, and it's approaching a significant effect, showing that, the, that we are modulating the light according to the instructions that the person is, is given to try to influence the system. Uh, so the peak there at, at time zero is exactly when the instruction is given, 
And we look a little bit lagged in time because it takes a little while for your mind to respond to the instruction. So roughly about one second after giving the instructions, you're close at this point to a statistically significant difference. Whereas for the control data where nobody's doing anything, you're just running it by itself, it's very close to chance. So it looks at this point like the wave interference effect seems to be causal. We need to do this experiment many more times to find out if that's in fact true. Because if it is causal, then we can send signals instantaneously from here to anywhere else and you can't block it. The second category is about polarized photons and so-called missing photons. Here's a picture of Lauren putting together the apparatus, which is actually right next to me over here. Uh, there's a picture of him, and notice how happy he is <laughs> when working on the apparatus, because it's really quite an amazing piece of, of equipment, and he'll talk to you about the reason for making this and some of the results we have with it. We're also looking at entangled photons, and the reason why entangled photons are interesting is because we think we're dealing with non-local mind, mind that is not just in your head, but somehow everywhere, and we're using non-local matter. So entangled photons, by definition, are a portion of quantum mechanics where you have matter, or in this case, energy, photons, that are connected non-locally. So we simply ask the question, is non-local mind related to non-local matter, or non-local energy? So we're using an apparatus that fits on the desktop, which produces about 1,000 entangled photons per second, a very high quality entanglement. Entanglement it kind of ranges from classical to super entangled, but this is producing a, a very well behaved entanglement system. And so it shoots out pairs of photons, they bounce off these mirrors, they go through polarizers, and then it goes to a counting system which you can basically prove that you're dealing with entangled photons. And the task is uh, you pay attention to the en entanglement system and try to increase the strength of the entanglement. So from any classical perspective, this would be impossible but we don't care about what is possible. We're interested in the impossible. So we want to see if the mind can increase entanglement strength, and in fact, in our experiment, it does. And under the control conditions where nobody's doing anything, nothing very interesting happens. So it does look like mental observation influences entanglement strength. We're also now using plasma, and for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is that all of the other systems that we're using are rather expensive. To make a, a reasonably good double slit uh, experiment takes maybe ten or twenty thousand dollars. The entangled photons apparatus alone is twenty-five thousand dollars. This thing costs forty dollars. <laughs> so we have it in in our shielded room by itself in the lab. We have a webcam looking at the plasma ball, and then outside. Well, on the left here is what it looks like on the inside. On the outside of the shielded room, we have a person sitting with a an effigy of the ball. It's the same kind of ball, it's just not turned on. And in front of them is a laptop. And we give instructions in. The person outside is asked to touch the right side of the plasma ball next to them. And we want that to be a mimic uh, to create, if you do that, you know, on a plasma ball, you pull the streamers over to where you touch. And so we're saying, do that, but mentally make this happen for the ball that's inside the box. So we're using it like an effigy. And the effigy is, is an important component here because most of these tasks are completely mental. It's, it's abstract. You know, you're doing it in your head. Whereas this, now we're saying, no, touch it like this and then make that happen there. So the kinesthetics of it helps you do the task. So here, just very briefly, is uh, these experiments usually follow the same protocol. You try to influence it and then you don't influence it. So we're looking at differential measurements of light in the ball. This is what the webcam sees when the experiment is run, but there's no humans doing anything. And you see little spots of light showing that the illumination level is different. This is what happens when you ask people to do it. And this, this is a task where they're trying to pull the light to the right. And so not only do you get a lot more differential measurements, but it looks like you're, in fact, pulling the streamers to the right, purely by your mind. Because this ball is inside our, our electromagnetically shielded chamber. Nothing should be able to influence that except somehow our minds are doing that. So this altogether costs less than $100 as compared to our ten and $20,000 equipment. And so we're going to pursue this uh, to the point where maybe we'll have a little package or a recipe, go buy this ball, go get this webcam, we'll give you the software, and then you can just try it yourself. 
So there's our INSX. We have a lot of foundations and individuals who have very kindly funded this research, uh, some of whom are probably in this audience. Thank you. So I'm going to stop there, and rather than, and we could do two things. So we could ask questions now about this, or we can wait until we're all finished. Oh, we ask questions now? Yeah, we'll wait. So we're, we're, let's go on to the next presentation, and then we'll hold your questions. Uh, so next up is Lauren. In my case, it's optical. So, Dean mentioned the quantum measurement problem, the observer problem, and something it's called. And it's a mystery. So, when, the, when quantum mechanics uh, was first developed, people uh, had a heck of a time coming up with the math to model what was going on because it was totally counterintuitive, and it still is. Uh, but the, the, the problem is that the math is absolutely correct, it always works, it's never failed in 90 years, but it, it it is reversible. The math doesn't have a direction of time in it. And so, but when you make an observation, you, you turn a wave into a particle, so to speak, into a definite answer, that is not reversible. How do you turn a particle back into a wave? You can't do it. So the math is somehow incomplete. And uh, the people who cooked this up about 90 years ago actually were quite convinced that consciousness had something to do with it although they had no idea how, and, and eventually the, the metaphysics of it um, became tedious, and they all went back to doing math. But, and, and so like uh, people have said, you want to study the metaphysics of how this works, you don't get a grant, it just doesn't happen. Because it, it shut up and calculate. So, but we are interested in this sort of thing. So, um, an example of that is the double slit mystery. The team uh, talked about the double slit a little bit, showed you how it worked. The, um, the problem is that, um, that the photon seems to go through both slits, except it hits at a point. So these little, and if you turn it way down so that it's really faint, and one photon at a, a second is going through, you still end up with the interference pattern as if it went through both slits. But you say, well, maybe it went through one slit and it somehow knows about the other one. So let's put a detector in front of one of the slits or next to it so it's, as it goes by, we can tell it went there. When you do that, the interference pattern goes away. It's like nature doesn't want you to know. <coughs> so then we figured, well, let's try observing it mentally instead of with an instrument in front of one of the slits, and the interference pattern goes away. It goes away a little bit, but it's, it, the statistics is un, unassailable. So what's going on? So we know that when, the, uh, when you turn a wave into a particle by observing it, it's what's called collapsing the wave function. What that means is it's, it's a probability wave is converted to a point, point source. Now, when you collapse the wave function, when you observe a photon in a double slit machine, you've converted, converted the wave into a point location. The photon is at a definite location, and then it continues from there. And when it continues from there, it's not exactly necessarily in the center where, it, where the laser would be. So you get a kind of a skewed uh, image on the camera, which I think is, is responsible for the, uh, the interference destruction. But in any case, uh, so if mental observation can collapse the position, I said, well, maybe it can collapse the spin. Now, photons have three properties, basically energy, the frequency, color, all sorts of um, And uh, position, momentum, direction, and spin. Now, photons spin both ways at the same time. I know this sounds crazy, but like I said, quantum mechanics is a little crazy. It spins both ways at the same time, and the amount of spin in each direction adds up to one. Actually, the square of it, it adds up to one. So it's proportional spinning one way and proportional spinning the other way, but they add up to one. If it's spinning all the way, entirely one, all one way, it's called circularly polarized. And that's how you have 3D glasses work in a movie, because you can tilt your head, and it doesn't change. Uh, linear polarized means both of them are spinning in opposite directions, exactly the same amount, so they balance out, that the, the difference in how they're skewed relative to the other is the angle of the polarization. So we thought, well, 
maybe if we have people observing the spinning photons that are spinning in some particular way, uh, we can see if they can change it. So this experiment cooked up, and it's sitting in a metal box about you know, so big, and it's got a laser and a uh, half-silver mirror, so some of the, la the laser power goes to a meter, so we can track the laser. The rest of it goes across the inside of the box. And then before it does, it goes through a horizontal polarizer. So the light going through the box is horizontally polarized to one part in 10,000. It's 99.99% polarized. And then at the other end, there's a mirror, and a half circle mirror, and it sends half the beam through a vertical polarizer into a camera, right on the chip, no lens, just smack on the chip. And the other one just is used to monitor the intensity of the beam that goes in the camera too. So the camera, the computer, looking at the camera, sees two spots. One of them goes through both polarizers, one of them goes through one. So the idea was that if you could twist the beam in the middle, you would change the polarization of the beam somehow, and more of it would leak through the second polarizer, which was tuned to be exactly as black as possible. So anything happening to that beam in one part in a million would make it brighter. That's the idea. So we ran this experiment, and this is what happened. Spin didn't change. The, uh, but what did change was both spots on the camera got dimmer. And you can see the p-values there, it's says four and six sigma, that's the that. sneeze at. So they both got dimmer, what the heck? So here's the um, results. So the balance beam is the beam that is singularly polarized, and the polarized beam is the one that's double polarized. And so they both got dimmer by a sigma amount. But the question is, where do the photons go? Now, um, photons are how matter communicates. Photon is emitted by a charged particle and it's absorbed by a charged particle, and that's it. There's no other way to deal with a photon. They just go from one charged particle to another. And so, for instance, right now in this room, there are 10 to the 15 or 16 photons entering each of your eyes every second, just from the light of the room. 10 to the 15, 16. Uh, but they're all, they all hit your retina and they all get turned into chemistry and you see the world. So, so this is this middle section here is in order for consciousness to gain information about the world, like I want to do something, I want to see something, there has to be something intercepting the photons, otherwise you have no knowledge of what's going on. So we're going to try to catch it. So I built this thing right here. You're all welcome to come up and take a look at it. I'll be around a little bit and explain the parts. But basically, there is a laser in the bottom, and a, um, I'll talk about that in a minute, a spatial filter which cleans up the laser beam. And uh, a sphere in the middle, uh, so it's painted white on the inside, so that any, any scattering would bounce around a lot, 30 times actually. And there's a photo detector that can detect femtowatts, if you know what that means. Uh, it will match across the room. And a camera at the top. And a very sensitive camera, by the way, astronomical camera. So this is the experiment. We set it up. Add people to concentrate on blocking the beam in the middle there when they're concentrating, and then when they're relaxing, to not do it. And then we looked at the camera rehurry and the, um, the photo detector. So we expected a negative correlation. If one goes up, the other goes down. And, um, and when we're actually nothing happens. So in order to run this experiment, it, it, we did a little recall this time. Instead of just having the subject sit there and do concentrate, relax, we had them sit there and do concentrate, relax. And then when they finished all those, those periods, we had the machine just run normally without them doing anything. They're sitting and reading a book. So does the presence of the person have any effect, even though they don't know whether they're supposed to concentrate or relax? So we'll get to that. So, uh, so here we go. The ones in boxes there are the ones with the persons who are sitting and reading a book. And the dark line on the bottom is the, uh, is the correlation. Okay. But the problem here is that when the person was concentrating, the, the spot on the camera got brighter. And the photo detector in the side went dim, exactly opposite of what we thought. So, <laughs> conjecture is that the, the uh, act of concentrating on the beam sharpened it, focused, and it, it made the spot smaller um, and brighter because all, all lasers have a little bit of a fringe that comes off the side, and this has gone to some trouble to clean up that fringe, but nonetheless, there's a little bit of a fringe, and it'll, it'll cause some scattering in the, in the sensor. Uh, but if you sharpen the beam, then there's less of that. So that would explain the results, but we still need to run more experiments. Also, we're going to do it again with a vacuum to see if it matters. Now, vacuum is interesting here. Uh, how much time have we got? 
Good, good. And on three, four more slides. So, this is like a, a hypothesis. Now, the vacuum is a special thing in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Uh, the vacuum uh, is very simple to imagine, actually. Um, here's the air. We have a room full of air, and the air molecules are nitrogen, like, you know, two of them, two uh, oxygen mostly. And, um, and if they're the size of my fist, they would be, on average, about that far apart, about 10 fist sizes apart. And uh, moving around at the speed of sound, about 700 miles an hour in the air. So the 99.9% .9 of what's in this room is empty space. And 0.01% is actual air molecules. So what is that empty space? It's the space between the air molecules, that's the vacuum. And so 99.9% .9 of this room is hard vacuum, just like outer space. So what the, it turns out that the vacuum has these interesting mathematical properties that were called virtual particles. And they pop into existence and go out. It just falls out of the math, the math is un unsaleable. Um, and, but they, they only last, they last short, short enough time that you can't really see them. They're inciting inside the uncertainty principle. So the idea here is that maybe we're, we're interacting with virtual particles to cause the results that we see. So this is a little Feynman diagram of so exactly what we're talking about. Time goes from the bottom up in a Feynman diagram. So on the left there, we have two electrons that are coming together. And at some point, when they're close together, one of them emits a photon, that's a little gamma thing. And it's the emission is a recoil, it kicks, it kicks the photon away, and then it hits the other one, is absorbed, and that the momentum there carries the other one away. So it looks like they collided, but they didn't really. They came close and then bounced apart. Those two on the right, those are that's what, how they grow a virtual particle. So the, the downward going arrow is a positron, it's a negatively or a positive charged electron, and antimatter has all the appearances of moving backwards in time. So it's drawn that way. So we have a virtual particle being created, paired, and destroyed. And another example from when it comes from a photon, it's just created and pairs destroyed. So these things happen in extremely small space of time, very small. So here's an experiment to see if, if we're getting either one of those two on the right. I'm gonna build this one of these days. Uh, I have, actually I have half the parts already. So this is all in the vacuum. And what we have in the middle there are two copper discs, oh, maybe you know, two inches in diameter, polished super flat, and a thousandth of an inch apart. And there's a million volts between them. Now, this is a phenomenon called vacuum polarization. Because if you have a virtual particle pair, if you have a strong enough voltage, you can pry them apart so they don't go back together. Then they become real particles, and they show up in your instruments. Now, a uh, physicist named Schwinger, about uh, 60 years ago, calculated what it would take to break down the vacuum. And it's about um, a billion, billion volts per meter to do that. But since quantum mechanics is probabilistic, I can get 40 billion volts per meter in the, on the desktop. And so I think maybe I can see some of that. Uh, the idea then is a little, little more interesting. So we have a laser, we want to send light, light through the, the split and see it on the camera. And all the, the laser and the camera can be outside the vacuum. And so this is the hypothesis, or the, the, the experiment, the protocol. So relax, concentrate, relax, concentrate. And check to see mentally if you think the laser's on. If the laser's on, push the button. We turn the laser on and off every four seconds or so. If we get current, that means we get charged particles being torn apart by this 40 billion volt per meter. If, and if we get current during concentrate, then the human is responsible. And if the laser's on or off, we can tell if they come from the vacuum or from the photons. And so um, that's, that's an experiment. I'm going to do it this, this summer, or late summer. And here's this where I'm going. So you want to know where I'm actually going. This is where I'm going. Um, so premise, consciousness exists outside space-time and has, because it has access to all space-time. And I want to know how. How does consciousness interact with the world? So the conjectures. Uh, acts through virtual particles concealed by the uncertainty principle. So you can't really see it happening because it's it comes and goes before you can catch it, but it's in there anyway. The other possibility is that virtual particles are actually a mathematical trick. They don't really exist. It's kind of like epicycles. We you know we came up with a mathematical way to calculate, and it just works. But there may actually be something else going on here from a uh, uh, higher, higher dimension. And then another, the last one, uh, it's a little more difficult to explain, but I think I can go through it essentially. Um, if I have a 